Welcome to the Creative Plane Podcast Network. Join us as we review our favorite RPGs, collectible card games, MMOs, video games, PC games, and bring up interesting topics and things that we'd like to share with everyone. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Hey guys, welcome back to Creative Plan Podcast Network. Jim here, and today I've been very lucky to get the chance to interview Sean Patrick Fennan, author of not only the fantasy role-playing gamer's Bible, but also, and more importantly, the megaversal powerhouse behind Savage Rifts. Wow, that's a hell of an intro. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Sean, trust me, as a pretty much from when Rifts first came out, Sourcebook 1 came out and Conversion Book 1 came out, I've been a fan of Rifts for a long, long time. And I'm, I'm, I'm discovering a lot of people in that category. Yeah, I, I was super excited once I heard that first mention of Savage Rifts was going to be coming out. Well, fantastic, and I'm really glad to hear that. And uh, by the way, congratulations. It looks like you unlocked the last achievement at the uh, $300,000 mark. Yeah, yeah, just uh, checking it right now uh, as we speak. It's 304 and 847 with nine days to go and 2,837 uh, backers. Yeah, we've unlocked everything that we've talked about. Just looking to see what else we have said I was just, keeping track of this thing has been as much crazy for me as anything else. But yeah, okay, yeah, we, we have said this. So right now, for the next uh, 10 stretch goals, potentially, uh, every $10,000, uh, we are looking at a uh, one-sheet adventure, which is basically one sheet are basically two plus actual pages, and they're, they're little adventures that uh, we may get some guest designers to, to do some stuff. I may do some, Ross may do some, heck, we may even cajole Shane into doing one. We're going to do those for everything from a novice up to eventually legendary rank so nice. that GMs grab those and, and uh, be able to run adventures all over doing all kinds of cool stuff. And that will be uh, the primary uh, stretch goals we do uh, if you know, for each 10,000 we hit from here until the end of the Kickstarter. Because we've already got a ton of stuff that we promised. And uh, we unlocked that expanded player's guide, which uh, we're right now reconfiguring all this uh, stuff to, to squeeze into that book and make it a bigger, more uh, juicy book. That's going to be awesome. I know, I was really excited when I saw the Player's Guide go, because that means more classes. Or in this case, you know, more more archetypes. Well, and actually, we're just, there's not going to be any new iconic frameworks. There's a ton of them in there. Uh, but you are going to get a lot of DBs uh, that you'll be able to choose from, for example, uh, which means a lot more variety in terms of character creation. You know, for example, you know, the, the Sim Van or the, the Grackle Tooth or the, the Quick Flex or the Altera. So you, you're going to get these these DBs that you can then, you know, add a, uh, a an iconic framework to and, and uh, rock it out and have all kinds of things going on there. Plus, uh, we're looking at uh, some more gear and equipment, sort of greatly expanded offerings for in terms of gear and equipment. I think we're going to put some more Techno Wizard stuff in there, which I'm really happy about because Techno Wizards are some of my favorite guys. Hey, I, I was excited when you guys unlocked the Techno Wizard thing because I'm like, yeah, because I've pretty much been GMing it ever since we started playing, but Techno Wizard's always my favorite class to actually play because there's mm -hmm. nothing cooler than gunning a laser pistol, putting in a diamond and some doodads, and it's now a magic pistol. Yeah, and I've got to say, uh, they were Techno Wizards and Cyberdice were, were my two favorites, and it was really nice for me to get a chance to really give them some love with this particular rule set. I'm excited about uh, how they both play now. Yeah, I joked with a bunch of our friends. I'm like, hey guys, you know how you like steampunk? Techno Wizards were t t steampunk before it was steampunk. 
Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And we, we definitely took that uh, to heart with the art decisions we made and things like that, too. Yeah, pretty much all of the art that you guys leaked on the uh, Kickstarter so far looks gorgeous. Yeah, we're pretty excited about that. And we're pretty excited about the response to that, so thanks. Well, Sean, definitely thank you for coming on the show and we're willing to do the interview. Uh, I know uh, quite a few of us gamers are uh, oh, just, a, just a little excited about your project <laughs> with Rivs, just a little. I mean, yeah. after all, we, we joked about it here in town the, the night of the opening Kickstarter that it, it hit in two minutes. That's the Yeah, for me, uh, as I was watching, it, it, was, it was a minute. But, yeah, it was like almost zero time at all. It was crazy. <laughs> and it was just picking up. Like I, I, I was kind of in shock for a little bit. It was wild watching that. <laughs> for those that don't know what Savage Riffs are, what would be your uh, kick line? You know, the back of the book description of what, what, what is Savage Riffs to you? Oh, boy. I get this, I asked this all the time. And I have a fairly standard answer. Although I kind of... I, I, I switch it up a little bit here and there, but uh, I, I consider Savage Rifts to be like a post post apocalyptic setting that incorporates everything from superheroic action to super science and sorcery, cybernetic ninjas riding robot dinosaurs, giant mecha, and, you know, scholarly archaeological adventures with high tech weaponry and, and just a little bit of guts, and uh, they're up against everything from a fascistic state of total domination to uh, a demon worshiping leader of a, another magical nation and monsters and demons and you know evil sorcerers and vampires and pretty much anything and everything you could possibly imagine including perhaps an entirely weaponized kitchen sink uh that's that's rifts in a you know crank to 11 gonzo kind of action setting <laughs> And pretty much that's exactly what it is. It's either as big and insane or as calm and, and storylined as you know you guys want it in your story. Yeah, yeah. But the fact of the matter is, you can you can legitimately go anywhere and do anything with this game. That, and that's one of the biggest coolest things about it. I mean, yeah. yeah and it's also important to understand that it has an immense amount of canonical, deep, deeply canonical information. So it's not just a well, the doors are wide open, you have nothing to do, you just figure it out and go whatever. It, it actually has established factions, established storylines. An immense amount of history, 26 years worth of published history, uh, and, and just all kinds of, of things to play with and factions to interact with and villains to specifically deal with. So there's plenty of story to play with there. The, the, the door is completely open for all the things you can consider with your imagination, and yet uh, you don't have to go searching for it. It's all there for you to just grab and, and, and run with, you know, in terms of wherever you want to go with it. Yeah, I mean... Trust me, since 1990, I've been picking up the wrist books from Palladium Books, and cause you can find some nugget of awesome storyline that you can just take off with. I mean, like, you know, the last ri actual Rifts group I ran, we actually were a bunch of Coalition soldiers. I, I had everyone pick Coalition OCCs, and their whole point was, okay, you guys are not the usual, typical Nazi-ish, you know, DB shooting not Coalition. You're a recon team sent to go down the coast because something's going on down there. And basically, I tied it into the mechanoids. Right. So I managed to use, you know, full six PA timeline coalition soldiers, but they got to play in mechanoids because there was a little secret faction of mechanoids still left out there in, in the coastline. Well, a lot of people are asking about the, the, the coalition. Certainly, we are establishing it as primarily a, a, an antagonistic faction, and it's run by a, a very antagonistic people. But, you know, there's absolutely nothing standing in the way. In fact, there's a design diary I just wrote today, which will be coming out soon, covers this. And it, it, it definitely says, you know, it would be extraordinarily easy for people to, to do that and, and, and to go pretty much anywhere they want to go with this. And, and that includes being able to do coalition soldiers as essentially, you know, good guys who perhaps fight, figure out that maybe not all DBs are evil and not all magic users are evil and, you know, figure out where you want to go, where you want to go, what you want to do from there. So anything's possible. Yeah, I mean, uh, and that's the beauty of role-playing games. With it, the, the storytelling and the players, as long as you talk it out, you can make anything happen. I sure mean, thing. one of one of my favorite players from, from when I used to run Risk all the time had a military intelligent officer that basically switched sides. And he basically, he role-played it off of... He went back to home, to home command and he explained it. This is why I did it. I was undercover, you know. And right. if you can play it off, sure, you know. That's that's the beauty of role playing games. I mean, it's is you have this huge storyboard that you can play off of, and it's here. Here's your sandbox. Go crazy. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, Sean, let's get into uh -huh. some personal questions here. So, oh, uh, yeah. I see. I, I know a bit of your bio because uh, I actually used to read Shadus magazine. Oh my God, that's yeah. a long time. <laughs> First introduction to uh, Knights of the Dinner Table, you know, way yeah. back in the day. So, uh, for those who don't know, about how many years have you worked in the field of gaming? Well, I started back in 1988. Uh, 
Yeah, well, it's a while. So anyway, I, I was doing some uh, articles and reviews for the Gamer Magazine, which was, you know, I was working with Scott Herring back then. People uh, from the Austin, Texas area know Scott. He's been around for, for a while. He gave me my first break. Then I made a pitch to do some stuff for Iron Crown and Hero Games for Champions 4th Edition. I started working closely with them for a long time. I got a chance to work on a lot of uh, other stuff. During that period, I worked on a couple of things for the initial Star Wars role-playing game, the West End version. Uh, worked on a little bit for their Shatter Zone line. Uh, I eventually got to do some stuff with White Wolf, a few, few pieces uh, here and there. Uh, also dabbled in the computer game industry for a while. About 95, I wrote the Fantasy Role-Playing Game Revival 1st Edition. Uh, still kept trying to do the computer game thing. Um, uh, Gamer Inquest magazine did some articles for them. Just dabbling. Still doing some champion stuff here and there. Uh, then uh, I ended up at some point taking a job with uh, the short-lived Obsidian Studios, doing some fusion game development with them. And then when all that kind of collapsed, uh, I actually ended up with Gamma, the Game Manufacturers Association. I've kind of just done everything in this industry except art because my uh, my stick figures look like they have epilepsy, so I have no capacity for art. But everything else, yeah, um, I was doing communications work and uh, event coordination work with uh, Gamma, helping run Origins and the Gamma Trade Show. And then uh, not too long after that, with a brief stint with a casual games company, I ended up with uh, Drive Through RPG and RPG Now, where I worked very closely with the OBS team, Steve Wick and all those guys, uh, doing uh, marketing and communications and business development for Drive Through and RPG Now on those sites. Which, by the way, that's what led to me going up and uh, meeting with Kevin Sambita. I actually drove up to Michigan from Alabama and sat down with him. That's where I was living at the time. I'm out in Denver now. But uh, sat down with him to convince him that we would like to get his uh, books and PDF up on drive through and, and after we had a really good conversation about that, and, of course, I, hey, polished the knuckle there. It was successful. I got the crazy idea of pitching the idea of doing a Savage Worlds version of uh, Rifts. I had already had some success doing some Savage Worlds stuff. I'd done an original version of Shintar, uh, the, my epic fantasy setting for uh, Savage Worlds, and, and it was involved in doing stuff with that, thanks to Shane. And uh, uh, So I thought the, the Rifts thing would be cool, and uh, that happened. <laughs> uh, it, took us, it took us a few years to get around to when we were finally uh, ready to do that specifically. In the meantime, I did another version of Shine Tar, did the Kickstarter with that. Oh, that's with uh, Savage Mojo now. And uh, worked on a few things here and there, but the Savage Rest Project finally got underway, and that's pretty much been all-consuming for me for a while now. <laughs> but yeah, I've been doing this for quite some time. Once you step through that rift, your world's been different ever since. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I, did, I did, forgot to mention, I actually did some work on the third edition of the Star Wars game for Fantasy Flight, and I also did a couple things for Ross Watson for the Dark Heresy line before that. So, yeah. Oh, sure. that's cool. Yeah, Fantasy Flight's one of one of our uh, our gaming group's new loves right now. Well, yeah, like I said, I, I've, I've had a chance to dabble with just about everybody in the industry. So, that's But I'm, nice. I'm really really proud of the work that we're doing with, with the Pinnacle. I'm very proud, proud to be a part of the Pinnacle team now. Okay, yeah, I know. that's it's oh, So many people are asking me, when is it coming out? And it's like... According to their Facebook, it's almost ready for the printers, you know, because <laughs> uh, for the for the Savage Rifts. Oh yeah, well I mean, it's, we're, we need to of course do some changes now mm -hmm, because yeah. expanded the players guide, so a little bit of work going on there. But yeah, it's a it's a solid team. We'll get this stuff knocked out soon. That's cool. I know we're all really looking forward to that. Just since you obviously have got the gaming industry covered, a quick question from a uh, game writer designer point of view: What does it take to be successful making games? Wow. Yeah. Just, just just a 10 second version you know as opposed to being you know able to include 300 different things i think <laughs> well i mean just look at the successful stuff and model your efforts after that it's never been easier to get into game design and, and publishing i mean right now there's user created content tools on drive through rpg and rpg now that that let you put stuff up you know like for the dms guild and You've got them for, uh, you know, Paizo. I think Paizo's got some stuff that they're doing, but you've got uh, uh, Monty Cook, you know, Cypher and uh, Margaret West Cortex have opened it up so you can use uh, their tools that they provide to put up your own stuff. So, I mean, anybody who's got some amateur designer chops and wants to try it out, I recommend those and just see how people respond to them or, again, respond to just how the 5th edition uh, DM Guild stuff mm -hmm. works out. I mean, online just opens it wide up. It's all sweat equity at that point. Um, but, you know, it's like, like I said, make sure you're looking at the successful stuff. Make sure you're modeling your efforts after, you know, people who've been doing this for a while because that's obviously, you know, they're successful. That will help you. You know, edit, edit, edit. And don't edit yourself. Make sure somebody edits your work. You know, uh, if you have to use... Um, 
you know, stock art to illustrate your stuff to start with. Make sure you choose good pieces. Um, it's get somebody or figure out how to do layout so that you, you know, when you put something up, it, it looks like something that people want to, uh, you know, you know, do more than just kind of glance at and go, let's ignore it. Yeah. So it, 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 like I said, it's never been easier, but you've also got an incredibly crowded field. So you've got to find ways to make sure that what you're doing is exciting and interesting and can grab people's attention. And then you've got to also be willing to engage people. You, you, it's not a good time to be an introvert uh, if you want to be a successful game person. You've got to be willing to communicate and uh, get it, you know, get with people and get them excited about your stuff. Go to conventions and run your games. You know, get online and run your games via Roll20 and things like that. You know, get as much exposure as you can because there's a whole lot of people out there trying to do it too. Yeah, I mean, it, I agree completely. It's, it's a golden age of gaming right now because literally it's anybody can self-publish right now. Or, you know, Kickstarter, it's a great format for game design. Oh, yeah. yeah Kickstarter has been an incredibly important part of the, uh, of the picture, especially for, well, pretty much for everybody, but especially for you know, publishers who are still, you know, smaller than say the very top one. Um, but it, it's it's made things so much easier for us to engage the fan base and find out if they want something, and then get their support in making that something happen. At the same time, you know, they're of course getting really good deals and getting cool stuff that they want. So that's that's another one of the sea changes. I sometimes talk about there's specific periods. Specific uh, thresholds that happened that changed the role-playing game industry. You know, desktop publishing was a huge part of it. Uh, digital publishing options became another massive part of it. Um, there's a few others, but uh, you know, then you know, LARPing. You know, the advent of, of, of LARPing really kind of changed the way we look at uh, the, the, the place as well. And then Kickstarter. You know, crowdfunding in a general sense, but Kickstarter in a very specific sense, changing everything again. So definitely. Yeah, I mean it's 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 all over the you know people no longer have to hunt and peck to find players too. It's it's one of the nice things is with social media even you can find a lot of players online now. Oh yeah, well that's that's the other thing. The, the advent of, of social media communication is another huge threshold. And that's a, not just for games but for everybody. But the ability to reach larger audiences quickly and easily. But uh, you know online gaming, and I don't mean MMOs. I mean you know, tool sets that will have, you know, virtual tabletops where they can connect with each other using Google Hangouts and Skype and what have you, uh, and the various, various options for that. That's been another massive advent for people uh, to, uh, to, to engage and play where they may not have the easiest time finding a group where they are. They may be a rural or small town where there's not a whole lot of gamers. So uh, that's, that's opened the world up for a lot of people as well. Yeah, I know. I definitely enjoy uh, Roll20. That's another good one of ours that we, we like using. Oh yeah, Roll Twenty has been a Roll Twenty by itself has been a game changer, and then like you know, the Fantasy Fantasy Grounds is a, is a good one, and I know there's quite a few others. I have not had as much time to get involved with those systems as I would like, uh, for which I, I feel kind of bad because I really want to support the concept. But man, I'm just so busy with the writing. <laughs> hey, I mean, it's not like you're doing a little, you know, just a little for the business, right? I mean, you're, you're bringing <laughs> a whole game system from its old system to a new one that people will be hopefully. That have you know been afraid to play it or have never seen it or never even heard of it, you know they can now jump into a whole new game system. Well, I'm very very gratified. We we we've all done a lot of work on this, and I've been very proud to work with this team you know on this. But yeah, it's it's been it's been uh, huge. It's been the most challenging design work of my life. I mean, I will I will also admit uh, I'm very very lucky. One of the reasons we moved to Denver is the, the gaming culture here is amazing. I, I I do not lack for people to play with. In fact, is I lack for time to play with them all. Oh, so that's that's you know, the hard one. <laughs> Denver, Denver's a great place for geeks and gamers, I'll just say that. <laughs> so uh, what was one of the, the, the big future ambitions that you actually have for Savage Rifts out there? What is, like, you know, the, the, the five-year plan, you know? What, what is something you'd like to touch in on? I am not going to talk about five-year plans here, but I will say <laughs> that we, 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 from the beginning, talked to Kevin about this being a line, and he insisted. He said, absolutely, he did not want to just be one and done with this or just a couple and done. He wanted to see this go for a while. He was very supportive of us being able to produce, you know, uh, a number of books. And uh, so uh, that is that is the plan. This will be an ongoing product line with multiple products that come out for it. I mean, there's over 100 books just for core, you know, Rift setting oh, stuff. Yeah. That's, that's what our license deals with right now. It's just the, the Rift's Earth and, and the stuff directly connected to that. And, you know, there's... <laughs> We could easily take the next five years just doing stuff that relates to that. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm definitely planning it. We've already started talking about what the next books will be. So you, you, you can trust that, you know, we have a plan and uh, we're currently working out which ones will come first. And we're having those conversations uh, over the next few weeks to, to make a long-term plan for those books. But we've got a list already of, you know, these are the books we want to do, the books that we think we have to do. 
Uh, and uh, it's going to somewhat model after the releases that you saw. I mean, not exactly, but I mean, we're we're starting with North America. We're talking about a specific area of North America, and we're going to kind of spread out from there. So we're going to make sure we touch on all the things that are important to where we're starting. So eventually, you know, the, that means the Vampire Kingdoms is something we'll definitely have to touch, and we'll have to get into discussing about the New West and. Uh, you know, the bigger picture of what I call Arcane North America, which deals with Laszlo and the Federation and, and all the, ex- the still existing, you know, magical areas and what they're up to, what's going on and, and bigger pictures of that. And then, you know, of course, the coalition deserves uh, a lot more uh, extensive treatment, you know, and then, you know, Canada and, and just all of that. But then eventually, you know, there's the rest of the planet that we're going to have to deal with, you know, South America, Europe, Africa, you know, Australia. I mean, all the rest of the planet is ultimately a place that, uh, you know, he's going to need some 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 love and some dream, and we just have to figure out which place we're going to go first. Definitely, I mean, uh, that that was one of the things I enjoyed with Riss when it evolved naturally. It's just like, okay, here's North America, here's Conversion Book, here's Atlantis, and I mean, Atlantis was huge when it first came out. Vampire Kingdom, you know. We then, we might deal a little bit with Atlantis too. Yeah, we we, we might have to touch on that a little bit. <laughs> I'm saying with a big grin because obviously that's a big deal. <laughs> a slaver or two might hit the East Coast. You know, a couple blind warrior women. And, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I always remember the the original Riffs cover, you know, with the slaver and the blind warrior women on it. That was one of those covers that immediately grabbed your attention when you walked by and saw it. Oh yeah, yeah, that, no no argument there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, just just for the folks that, in case they don't get to hear this till after the Kickstarter ends, since it's been going on and for about another nine days, where yep. will they be able to buy Savage Rifts once it uh, hits its goal and it's it's published openly? Anywhere you can buy any other Pinnacle Entertainment products, and that sounds cheesy, but it, it, it's absolutely true. So yes, directly from the Pinnacle site, uh, Drive Through RPG and RPG Now uh, will be uh, options as well. Uh, your friendly local uh, game store. Uh, we already know a number of uh, game game stores are clamoring. They're already bugging their distributors saying, win, 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 give, 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 now, now, now. Um, so uh, we definitely expect to see quite a few Savage Rest books on shelves out there, uh, you know, around, uh, around the country and around the world. So uh, I would certainly encourage your, your listeners uh, to either, you know, go ahead and, and, and go to the Pinnacle site, uh, not right now, but when they when they become available, you know, order them there. Like I said, drive through and, and, and RPG Now, those sites. Uh, but if you like supporting your local game store, go talk to them and say, hey, I want to buy this from you. Make sure you order it as soon as it's ready. So, you know, it's, that's, that, that, that's the deal. I mean, Pinnacle's all through those channels. Yeah, I definitely know Mark over to Sun Games and Gadgets is looking forward to because just like me, he's a, he's a Rifts player from way back in the day. <laughs> yeah, my local store is Total Escape Games, and John has made it clear he's absolutely you know wants to have me do a big event at his store and, and you know, like a release party and things like that. And you know, there's going to be all kinds of fun stuff. That'll be awesome. Oh, so yeah. this this last Saturday at Savage Saturday, uh, Kelly and I got lucky enough over at Isles of Games. To, we got to game with Daryl Hayhurst at over at Isles Games, and we got to play uh, a bunch of the Toro Legion heroes and save some dog boys and take out some dead boys. And I got I got lucky with a boom gun and took out a enforcer with one shot that exploded, and it was nice. Boom, <laughs> boom! And it, literally, Daryl was funny at the table. He's like, "Now, if you're gonna play the Glitter Boy, every time you shoot, you gotta say boom." <laughs> and it, it was a great time. I mean, uh, when we were gaming at one point, I rolled Snake Eyes. And, Uh-oh. and he's like, all right, I get a chance to use the chart. And I just looked at him and like, from one GM to another, maybe I didn't have my pylons out. And he's like, oh, my God, can I use that? I'm like, I wouldn't have said it if you couldn't. <laughs> yep. Oh, no. So blow yeah. me off the back of the map. But still, my yep. shot hit, which is the important part. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the technical difficulties chart, which is uh, in there to you know account for stuff going you know glitchy and, and going bad on you, and it really does enhance the role of your your fixers and mechanics and your techno wizards in the in the group too. But it, that's a fun thing. I know he's looking for that. But yeah, not having your pylons down yeah, when you fire <laughs> that's that's a that's definitely a thing. Yeah, we're really excited. Uh, Daryl got really excited early on about this, and uh, after talking with him and realizing you know his passion for it, uh, I was going to you know say, "What you played with that hack? What's he doing?" But the fact of the matter is, uh, one of the adventures that we've got in the Kickstarter is written by Daryl, and uh, so it's, I'm looking forward to doing more with him. He's he's brought a lot to the table. That's that's going to be good. Yeah, he was telling us that. Uh... Hey, if you want to have, know what happens next, you have to join the Kickstarter because the adventure may be continuation of the story. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. I, I know that. I, I know which what he's talking about too. So you got to play Glitter Boy, and it sounds like you had a good time. 
and, and Kelly got to play a Cyber Knight. So tell me about how that went. Hey, it was it was a great game. I mean, the way our group dynamic broke down, we had a, uh, a heavy combat cyborg and my glitter boy, and Kelly was playing her Cyber Knight partnered with a juicer, and pretty much we actually did the faux pas, faux pas, we split the party. We had Uh-oh. the Cyber Knight and the juicer go inside the building, while the two heavy hitters stayed outside and played decoy plus, you know, kept all the attention of the Skelebots on us. And using the Savage World rules, it it ran super smooth. I mean... It was some big, scary, hairy fights, but it, it, you know, honestly, using the Benny system and the whole breakdown for do what you're good at, and if you don't have a skill for it, hey, find a way to use a stat for it, and it just worked out beautifully for for the story that we just laid out. I mean, Kelly really loved the Cyber Knight because she had this whole total vibe of, you know, Cyber Knight with her side blade out there, and she'd use her spirit instead of other things to, to swap tricks. And our juicer was amazing, literally using the agility trick to drop a hand grenade in the, the villain of the story's belt and run past him. I mean, literally multitasking because she had yeah. some cool, you know, traits of stuff the grenade in their belt and jump over him and keep going. Yeah, very, very cool. So was she having a good time with the whole Cyber Knights automatically? You can use a lot of their powers as free action thing. Was that working out for oh, her? Oh, she was loving that. She's like, I can do that. I can do that. And, it's, and we're all looking at her like, yeah, go for it. Do it. And she was just rocking the encounters with the Cyber Knight, which and, and I love the, the just you know, when we looked at all the character sheets because we had the Cyber Knight, the Mind Melter, the Leyline Walker, the the Combat Cyborg. I mean, just looking at all the character sheets, the way you guys broke them down, that it, it looks so beautiful and fluid. Well, I, thank you. Yeah, we uh, that's that is uh, very gratifying to hear, and I'm really glad you guys had a great time with that. That that means a lot to me. Every time I get to hear about somebody who got to play, and they're all excited, and they're, they're telling me how they use the abilities, and they loved all the cool things they get to do. That's just, you know, that feels great to me. So, and, and it was funny because some of our players at the table that weren't Rifts players, um, you know, since I've GM played it for years, I went on and on about the glitter boy. I'm like, oh yeah, I stay in there 16 hours at a shot. I've got food and water inside the suit. It's it's fully built this way, you know. I come from a long line of the North American military alliance, you know, and just going on and on. Of course, you know, Daryl was loving it because it's like here's somebody at the table who 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 grew up on riffs, you know. Roxanne, you can go to that because yeah, we we kept we keep talking about how, you know, you can do anything and it's just over the top and anything goes. But again, there's all of that deep canon, all of those amazing you know, the history and all the stories, all of that's there to play with too. I mean, this is a setting that that has established continuity and content and yet also is wide open for everything else yeah i mean that's 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 one of the things i'm really hoping because of course our group here we're in we're in arizona we're, we're actually hoping with savage risk we can rewrite some of the canon so not all of arizona got destroyed <laughs> it's it's quite a few of our, our listeners were joking about when we mentioned savage risk it's like so the west coast is fairly unexplored what can we do there and i'm like guys have you not read the indian nations there's a lot going on over there already yeah there there there, there is uh and we definitely intend to get into that and uh where possible you know maybe even breathe some life into some things so uh yeah that's that's all part of uh, our future plans so so uh, in, in relation to the gaming we had, we had a great session playing with the Tomorrow Legion. For those who don't know what the Tomorrow Legion is, w- what is the Tomorrow Legion? Well, it's, it's as Ross you know, uses the term, and I think it's a very good one, it is an adventuring paradigm. So it, what it means is you know, there's a group that gives you a reason to get all these eclectic and interesting and, and multi-talented characters together, who otherwise might not have a reason to. And uh, gives a focus and a purpose to to that group of characters uh, outside of, you know, being, in this case, post-apocalyptic, you know, wandering murder hobos or mercenaries or or (laughs) just kind of people looking for something to do. Um, This is a tradition, you know, that has existed in in many savage settings for a while. You've got the idea of the Twilight Legion that uh, pervades uh, the the Deadlands setting uh, and is also very much a part of the Weird Wars line. You've got the Rippers, which of course you know is the eponymous eponymous uh, name of that setting, and uh, and so on and so forth. So, in fact, the whole Tomorrow Legion is sort of a callback to the the Twilight Twilight Legion idea. And in my own personal headcanon, I mean, it's not official. This is just one possibility of many that you could play with in the story if you wanted to. Um, but if this were, for example, you know, a version of Earth where you know you wanted to say that all the events of 
of the different weird wars and deadlands and rippers were all, you know, at all that had happened in this version of Earth. You know, then there was the Twilight Legion back during all of that, and then somehow that evolved into what became the Tomorrow Legion and this version of, you know, Rift's Earth. You know, that's a fun place to go if you want to. And again, it's not official, it's not going to be, but it's just one cool place to go for your own campaign. Uh, so the Tomorrow Legion is our callback to that same idea. You know, it is a group of people formed to give the heroes a reason to get together and go do, you know, missions and special things and, and be heroes because, you know, that's also a traditional part of the Savage Worlds game experience. I mean, you can ignore it. You can completely ignore it. You can just go and be murder hobos or be mercenaries or, you know, be raiders or, you know, whatever you want to play, whatever you want to create and do. It's, it's your game. It's your campaign. And, and the tools are going to be there. But we think the GMs are going to really appreciate having an out-the-gate uh, setup for that. I mean, historically, in the actual canon of the setting, which Kevin was incredibly supportive of, he was very excited about this. And he said, yeah, you know, this is something I think we've needed in the setting for a while. So this is really cool. By all means, add this. I mean, we you came up with a whole storyline about how these dwarves from another realm, which may or may not have anything to do with, anything to do with my Shintar setting. <clears throat> so um, <laughs> these dwarves show up, they find this place, which is an actual real place, by the way. It's a real uh, place in the world called Lead Hill. And there's a uh, there was a group of people who were trying to actually build a castle resort kind of uh, park thing. Uh, and as far as I know, it, it's still true that they ran out of money. It didn't all come together the way they wanted to, and they were trying to sell it off, whatever. But we decided these dwarves came across this place. And it's right near Branson, Missouri, by the way. It's right there on the border between the very northern tip of our northern part of Arkansas and the very southern part of, of Missouri. It's right there in that border area, uh, sort of in the middle. And uh, uh, so, so these dwarves found this this foundation. They built a castle, and then. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, and then again, this is the era after Tolkien, the Magic Kingdom has fallen, and there's really refugees everywhere. And this, this cyber knight, this older cyber knight shows up with all these people and says, can you help these people, please? You know, and I will try to get you help and, and support. And he actually leaves a bunch of uh, powerful, capable people behind to help protect all these people and help the, the dwarves kind of, kind of build things up and protect them. And then he brings some more people. And eventually they find out this is Lord Coke, the founder of the wow. cyber knights. Um, he was trying to save as many people he can, as he can in the aftermath of the fall of Tolkien. And eventually Erin Tarn comes and visits. She doesn't stay, but she, she comes and visits. A few other people come and visit. And there's this whole thing where we talk about how, you know, let's build something here to not only protect these refugees and, and to, you know, because the castle did become Castle Refuge. But the idea was, you know, while we're at it, let's look at the future. Look, look at the world. You know, there's still these dangers, there's other things going on. Instead of trying to necessarily, you know, call back to the past and find a way to recreate the past, let's take the world we have now and build a better future, a better tomorrow. And that's where the name Tomorrow Legion came from. So the idea is that these are, you know, special people who are part of the defense group of this castle. But more importantly, they go out and they find other communities to to create bonds and relationships with. So there's a good bit of, you know, social diplomacy kind of thing that can go on there. They're exploring the region in, in a broader sense, and, and so you get the whole exploration kind of thing going on, and you know, because there's still a bunch of wilderness in this area. Uh, they're protecting against the, you know, the coalition, because to the far to the south is, uh, you know, uh, coalition state El Dorado, and to the north is CS Missouri and Chi Town and all that. To the west, you've got the Pecos Empire, you've got the post, you know, the or the, uh, the apocalyptic cavalry. Eventually, you've got the vampire kingdoms out there. To the east, you've got the Magic Zone and the Federation of Magic, which currently being run by a complete psychopathic, you know, murderous, you know, jackhole in Lord Dunskin. So there's a lot of evil and horrible things that can happen there too. So surrounded by by threats, they're trying to build out and expand, connect to communities, and create something special. And we think this is a cool foundation to get specialized characters together and let them go out and do cool, awesome, heroic things. Uh, so that's that's the point behind the Tomorrow Legion. And a lot of the adventures that we've come up with and a lot of the source stuff that we've come up with supports that, but by no means obviates the ability to go anywhere else or do anything else. See, that's that's really nice because as somebody who's jammed a lot of riffs, <clears throat> you, have, you have to go through the gambit of, okay, you're a bunch of mercenaries hired for a mission. Okay, the black marketeers have you know, coerced you into working for them, you know, oh, um, you're a suicide squad because the coalition caught you and they're going to send you to do this thing. You always got to come up with that. What's the glue to stick the group together? Right. And and Tomorrow Legion is a really good wrap up of here. Here's why you guys are heroes, you know, and it's a good home base for you, too. Yes, exactly. You know, I mean, 
the GMs can certainly run scarcity based games and, and, and have everybody counting their credits and making sure they, they save up and stuff like that. But, you know, I kind of like the idea that at least for purposes of basic, you know, ammunition refills and, you know, basic health care and a place to sleep and <laughs> food, you know, I kind of like running with the idea that, you know, the heroes really don't have to worry about that stuff. You know, they've, they've got bigger things to worry about, which is, you know, not getting killed by all the amazing, horrible stuff out there. <laughs> Um, so that's, you know, I, I tend to like that. But again, you know, there are GMs who look at this. It's still post-apocalyptic, so I want the scarcity. I want those challenges. And that's easy enough to, to, to you know, also implement and play with. After all, I definitely see uh, the Tomorrow Legion being used more often than anything else just because of, hey, we're showing up. We only got four hours to game. This keeps life simple. Exactly. And that's really the foundation of, of you know, the whole Savage World's philosophy is, you know, let's get, get, you know let, let's get into the good stuff. Let's not worry about all the administrata and, and, you know, the little fiddly bits and things like that, you know, you know, this gives us a good reason to go off and do this cool thing. Let's go. Boom. We're the Jamar Legion. We're here to help you. Yep. Oh, crap. There's a very giant monster and it's got a cannon for a head. Run! <laughs> you know, that's, that's, uh... Sounds like a certain robot suit, I remember. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. So, mega trappings. What are mega trappings? Well, they're not called that anymore, actually. Oh. Uh, that was a, an, an older idea. Uh, we've, we've since uh, revised that slightly. In fact, as one of the design diaries gets into this. So I think it's the first one. Uh, now they've changed the, the name for them. And they still work essentially the same way, but they're the mega powers now. Um, you know, we, we decided trappings was the wrong word because trappings is just sort of something small that adds on to an existing power. These are mega powers, which are extensions of powers. But, you know, you, you spend more on them and you use them and they're just bigger. <laughs> so this was our way of, of taking the, the core power system from Savage Worlds uh, and going bigger with it. I mean, uh, Superpowers Companion and Necessary Evil goes into the realm of pure on super, superheroics, but it, it works for superpowered beings who are using powers in a comic book super, superhero sort of way for the most part. Uh, we needed a way to take the core rules, or the, the core powers, and go, you know, take the magic and the psionics idea and the weird science and everything else and let it go bigger as well. You know, because in a game like Rifts, uh, in a setting like Rifts, I should say, you know, the, the magic wielding people and the psionic wielding people need to be able to crank it to 11, just like the guys picking up the Oh My God guns. Okay, so and, sort of like the uh, when Kelly was playing the Cyber Knight, she had the ability to pump extra ISP into the weapon and boom, you know. Right, and do, and do the mega damage with it. Now, mega damage, of course, just had the, the effect of, of heavy damage for those who know Savage Worlds. It means she can cut through something that normally um, she would, uh, you know, not be able to because it's it's got mega, you know, it's got basically what's called mega damage capacity armor or MDC armor. Um, but uh, the... Uh, you know, the current the, the 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 version of the Cyber Knights that she was playing. You know, there had she had the you know ability to just pump a little ISP in there and make it do a little bit more. So <laughs> yeah, you know, like she's she's able to do that. That that's not quite the same thing as what I'm talking about though. Especially for some characters to spend a little bit of their energy to to do mega damage is not the same as mega powers. Mega powers is a bigger concept. Uh, what I'm talking about there is the case if you have the bolt power and you're a master of magic or you're a master psionic, because either one of these will work. That means you automatically have access to the mega power version, uh, which is called Onslaught. So Bolt, for example, when you uh, when you use Bolt, you can spend one, two, or three power points. In this case, it would be PPE if you're an arcane caster, or ISP if you are a psionic. And you could cast up to you know, one, two, or three, two die six damage bolts. And if you wanted to otherwise spend two power points, you could just do a single three die six bolt. Boom, that's that's bolt in the course of its rules. Now, uh, and I'm just going to read this right off the screen, uh, Onslaught, which is the mega power version of bolt, uh, you can spend um, two to eight or four, as it's called, because most of these work on the double cost, you know, double, double power cost. Uh, the range becomes 18, 36, 72, and uh, using this mega power allows the caster to throw up to four three die six bolts, or for two power points, well, not or, you know, for two power points each, or a single six die six bolt for four power points, and in either case, the damage is mega damage. So that is your big boom spell casting, right? You're going to spend more energy doing it, but this is your, I need to take on that uh, the UIR1 Enforcer with my magic. Kaboom, there it is. Massive, massive onslaught. 
Right. So there's, you know, I want to throw a bunch of, of, of bolts, you know, or I'm going to throw this really, really big one. And uh, boost lower trait, you know, has the greater boost lower trait mega power, which basically just doubles the effect of the power. You spend four power points and you cast it, but it, on a success, it gives plus or minus based on whether it's boost or lower. Plus, you know, if it's boost, it's plus two die types for a success and plus four of the rays. So basically, it's just bigger versions of the powers. Uh, in some cases, very simple mathematic, it's a doubling. In other cases, it's a little bit more. Uh, it, it gives you uh, something else, like teleport can just you know, suddenly become this really amazing thing that you're just, you know, you're going much further and you're able to carry many more people without, you know, getting yourself in trouble, for example. You know, and uh, and so on and so forth. So the, the mega powers are ways of doing big super magic and super psionics, essentially. That's cool. That's, you know. that's the point. Yeah, they, they, it basically lets you feel that you are a nigh unstoppable magic user now. Yeah, I mean, well, until you run out of energy. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, the people are like, well, if they're going to be this expensive, uh, you know, what's going to happen when you, because I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to run out of power soon. Well, we do allow the, the higher level, you know, caster types to get more power. Uh, there's, there's different ways that they can do that. Plus, you know, the arcane casters can draw power right off of ley lines, for example. Mm hmm. Um, you know, whereas uh, when somebody's a major psionic, because there's minor, major, and master psionic, and if you're a major psionic, and this is just an, an acceleration point for when some iconic uh, frameworks automatically start out with major and master psionics, others you can build up towards that. But when you have that, every time you take the power points edge, it gives you 10 instead of 5 uh, ISP. So we do account for that by giving you access to more power to play with. And of course, you know, with with any good magic user, it's all about location, location, location. <laughs> Especially if you're a leyline walker. Leyline walkers are nasty anywhere, but put them anywhere near a leyline, and they are going to own the day. <laughs> I, I know that got me excited when the, the topic of the maps that there's the leyline nexus map. I'm like, oh yeah, that's going to get used uh, by some magic users. Actually, I need to make a correction there. There there is a master map, but it doesn't have all the leylines on there. We leave that to the game master. Okay. That is. Uh, that is not a, a thing where we're going to lock GMs down uh, to. If it's not on the map, you can't do it. Um, you know that this is a uh, yeah. We just there, there's ley lines everywhere, and and the game is always kind of set up around the idea that you know the GM could easily decide where a ley line is. It's supposed to you know it has to be on the map or it doesn't. You know it doesn't play. And uh, we did come up with a cool way for GMs to randomly determine it if they did not want to be arbitrary. Well, that's cool. You know so basically. Uh, Anytime there's a, like, is there a ley line nearby and the GM is not prepared to simply say one way or the other, they can roll two die six. And if a six comes up on either of the two die six, then yes, there is a ley line nearby. And if they somehow both come up as a six, then there's a, not just, you know, a, a single ley line. There's at least two and there's a nexus nearby. Nice. That's a nice, quick and easy way to do that that doesn't lock the GM to only what's on a map. And hey, the beauty of ley lines is it's it's like underwater rivers. You know, you never know when one might ebb and flow into another. You know, right? Hey, what's here today may may change for some reason. You know, maybe yep. a rift drain that sucker dry. So there's that any way you want to play with that, it's there. And of course, the GM's guy gets into many more cool things with uh, randomly generate being able to randomly generate the si the size, type, nature, and all the other aspects of a rift when it opens up. As well as the you know locations you might go to if you happen to go through a rift. Nice. All right. So uh, that covered the the mega powers, which right. I'm so definitely looking forward to seeing those coming out. See, because I'm I'm thinking I'm going to be spending weeks just going through this book, coming up with different character concepts and things. Yeah. So as a quick note to anybody who's played uh, older iterations, uh, one of the things you'll see in this this new version is that you know, we originally had a a, a major separation between Master Psionic Powers and the Mega Trappings, as we called them. We made things simpler and call us those all under the, the Mega Power section, although there are some very special uh, psionic abilities that now function as edges that you can pick up. Nice. So. Mechanolink. I think the, the, telepath, the psychic version of Mechanolink, that was always my favorite power. Telemechanics. Telemechanics. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that is a special edge that you can pick up as a, uh, as a psionic. Yeah, that was always one of my personal favorites. Of course, I used to always like playing uh, Techno Wizards, too, so that, that kind of led to that one. Well, te Techno Wizards automatically have a variation on that. They automatically have a, a machine. It's called Machine Maestro, and it's their special ability to interact with machines, especially Techno Wizard machines. But Psionics can definitely pick up the Telemechanics ability. So. 
Nice. And since the, the Psi operator <laughs> is under the Mars structure automatically, uh, it, it, you know, goes towards that. So. Yeah. Then, then comes the GM's constant question of, "Hey, GM, can I walk up to that uh, Death's Head transport and open the door because I have uh, telemechanics?" <laughs> well, there there are rules for how that would work now. So that's cool. So also another rule that we we found out from the Juice Runner group. Could you explain to everybody what Blaze of Glory is? Ah, well, um, it's interesting because uh, Blaze of Glory was originally designed specifically for juicers, but ultimately we decided that it was something that all characters should get access to. And in fact, we see this as being something that is going to become fairly popular in other Savage Worlds games as well, because this is now sort of a broad-based settings rule. Uh so, Blaze of Glory is a narrative uh, kind of thing. This is kind of taking, bringing the 21st century narrative game design ideas a little bit, uh, is, is an additional thing to play with in Savage Worlds. Um, the basic way Blaze of, Blaze of Glory works uh, is this. Uh, if you take an incapacitating hit and you can't soak enough of the wounds and you're going to go to the, inca- the incapacitation chart, the incap chart, as we call it, uh, you can choose not to roll. You can say, you know what, today is a good day to die, or you know, I, I just you know go big or go home. This is it. I'm not spending any more bennies on this. I'm not going to just r- risk bleeding out or being dead. I'm going out in a blaze of glory. So at that moment, uh, you, you uh, it kind of depends on when it happens, but I mean, technically, at the moment you decide that you get three bennies, and you have the rest of the session, and you, know, you walk out of the fire somehow unscathed. You know, somehow you, you grabbed a branch instead of falling over to your death, you know, or it was just a flesh wound or whatever, and you're okay. You're fine. No wounds, nothing. Um, you are going to die. There is no way out. There's no healing you. There's no resurrecting you preemptively. There's no, there's nothing anyone can do to stop you from dying. You are going to die that session, but you as the player get to decide how you die, and what you accomplish with your death. And this becomes a, an interactive narrative aspect between you and the game master. Uh, you know, there's two ways generally this can play out. Either you take the, that unlucky hit from some mook in the, in a, in the first, you know, early battle, and then they get a headshot in you, and they do eight wounds, and you're like, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to soak this, and I'm not going to walk around with two wound levels and, you know, crippling injury. Or what. You know what? I'm going out of ways of going this session. So you get your three bennies, and you don't, you know, you're, you're fine. It was just a flesh wound. It was just a scratch or whatever. With the knowledge that at some point you need to say, you know, okay, this is my Blaze of Glory moment. Now, what has more practically happened in most of the games that I've run so far is that uh, that that incapacitating, deadly, horrific hit happens like in the main battle, the final big confrontation. So they immediately go ahead and do their Blaze of Glory right away. In which case, the bonus don't matter because, as I said, at the moment the player says, I'm going out to Blaze of Glory, it is now a discussion between, you know, he or she says, you know, this is what I want to do. They describe their cool scene. And as long as it's not, I kill every bad guy ever and we win everything forever, you know, I mean, that's not reasonable. But, you know, it's they can take a major thing that's going on and do the cool sacrifice player, the cool dramatic thing that changes the, the, the conditions of the battlefield in a significant way. It takes out, you know, for example, I had a glitter boy get cut down by the heavy railgun of a URO enforcer. And he said, you know, yep, this is it, going out in a blaze of glory. And he ran up and he bear hugged the UAR-1 with his glitter boy uh, as he's, you know, like cut in half. And uh, as he's dying, he's like, see you in hell. And he sets off his nuclear reactor and takes out both machines, which then basically saves the ass of everybody else in the group because they were, the, the UAR-1 was going to tear them up pretty bad. That's a perfect blaze of glory. I had Michael Serbrick, uh, one of our authors that uh, Evil Beagle works with. Uh, he's uh, the lead guy on the... the um, Aaron Alston Strike Force project, and we've just launched the uh, Michael Serbuck Presents line with a couple of stuff uh, from Evil Beagle Games. Uh, so he was playing in a game that Ross Watson was running, which was much more social. There was a couple of factions trying to lure this particularly special and important person to go with them, and uh, he had been talking to the, the to this kid throughout the course of the adventure, and uh, we got to the end of the adventure, and there was still that final discussion of, is he going to go with these guys, or is he going to go with those guys? Uh, or is he going to go with the Tomorrow Legion and let us help him since we were going to try to be more neutral and not try to sway him to one particular political whatever, except for maybe, you know, just trying to be a good guy. And Michael decided his juicer's blaze of glory was giving a final speech, a final plea for the kid to decide, decide to go with the, the Tomorrow Legion. And he, you know, he dies. 
giving that last speech. So, I mean, that was a really cool and completely unexpected use <laughs> of Blaze of Glory. And of course, you know, because it was his death speech and it was his death, you know, there was no role involved. It was just, there you go. The, the kid says, you know, the kid decides to honor his death and his plea and goes to the Tomorrow Legion. So uh, the key part of this and the thing I really love about this is how it really takes what can be just an incredibly frustrating and disappointing and, and, and maybe not exciting uh, moment in a player's life, or it can be. If you have a good GM and a good player, they can make it work. But this really solidifies the relationship between the player and the GM and makes that character's death something special and meaningful every time. It has that action cinema beautiful moment of you know that last scene. This is where the player has complete control of, of the narrative of how their character dies, and that becomes an incredibly important and memorable moment for both that player and everybody else at the table. And I really, really love that. Yeah, I mean, that becomes a huge story rolling, uh, story playing element is all of a sudden they literally own their death, you know, and that becomes huge in the game itself because that way you don't go out like a punk, you know. You right. know that you went out like a boss, you know. Out like a boss, exactly. Now, we originally, as I said, created this for the juicers because they have a whole mechanic now for their death arc. This is in one of the... Uh, the, the uh, design diaries I, that, that we have out there. So if you get to the Kickstarter and, and find the freebie download design diaries, uh, we talk about the juicers burn. So we won't get into too much of that. But basically, juicers now have contri- a, a lot more control. Um, they're, you know, they, they can use their burn, which is kind of their life force, to do superhero things. And eventually, that, that number is going to run, run out, uh, whether they like it or not, based on the die roll mechanic that they have to roll at the beginning of your session. Uh, so they have the whole thing of, you know, one day they're just going to say, you know what, today's, my, today's a good day to die. Today, you know, the tremors have gotten too bad and I know I'm going to die. And they get to declare Blaze of Glory right there and then, you know, instead of re-rolling anything or, or whatever. So uh, we designed it for them because we always wanted the juicer's death arc to have meaning. And we so the Blaze of Glory was important to that. But then as we play tested it, it was Shane at first. He said, you know what, this is way too cool. We cannot hold this to only them. Everybody has that access to this. So there it is. All of a sudden, everybody wants, wants that ability of, because in Rifts, let's be honest, it's it's a very high power level you know world. People huh. die in a flash. You know, it's it's one of those of somebody shoots a volley of plasma missiles, stuff happens. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's there. It, it, you know, there's huge big guns, massive amounts of armor piercing. Oh my god, magic! We just talked about that. You know, kaiju can come out and just stomp a city flat. And you know what's going to happen. <laughs> Um, the other thing, by the way, is for people who are like, well, what if I don't want to die? I mean, you're saying that death is going to be this high rate. Well, there's another thing that we did. Um, it's a variation on something that you find in the Superpowers Companion uh, in Necessary Evil. It's called the Death and Defeat Table. So when you take that incapacitating hit and, and you do blow it and it says that you're dead, you may not actually be dead. There's a setting rule table that you get to roll on that you may, in fact, just be dramatically changed. You know, that's... Uh, <laughs> That uh, you know, that day that uh, you you got blown into bits, but you know the you know a, f- a few weeks later you're back. You're just very very heavily cybernetic now, uh, you know. Or or you know, it, there's any number of ways that you could be changed in some important way, as opposed to just being dead. And we thought that was important to also have as an option for players in a game that could potentially be highly lethal, just because of how much power is being thrown around. And in in, in the environment that Rifts is, I mean, there's you know. You can be brought back in so many different ways. I mean, you can be a bioborg, you can be a regular cyborg. You know, sometimes yeah. you just don't want to die. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, we we're, we don't have all of those things mechanically in play just yet, but cybernetics is certainly there, and uh, you know, that's that's something that uh, can can definitely be played with. And the rest of that stuff, we'll we'll see how that comes about. But uh, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's any number of ways that uh, the player's story arc can change in an interesting way rather than just being dead. Although, de- again, death you know, it, it, death is a choice a player can make, and it could be an awesome choice at that point. Mm-hmm. Especially if you, if you go out saving the group, you know. Right. And, and hopefully as they're, they're cheering you on and they're amazed and awed at your death moment, you have an idea of what you want to play next time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and we, we we certainly see that you know the player's still in the glow of that was a cool moment, and then they're sitting down talking about what they're, they're going to play next, but they still got that cool moment that everybody appreciates. Oh yeah, and and the nice thing with Rifts is there's always another cool idea that you can come up with in the game. I mean, it, it it's literally jam packed full of awesome ideas, you know, just waiting to happen. Oh yeah. So I do have a couple lists of questions that we got from our. Uh, 
fans on Twitter as well as Facebook and some emails when I kind of bragged about us getting this chance to do this interview. Sure, sure. So the first question I have, which I personally like the idea of, is what are your thoughts on eventually having a novel or book series written about the Tomorrow Legion? Well, um, I'm never, you know, never say never. I say anything's possible, but you know, as you know, this is a licensed property, true, so true. I don't know that that's a feasible thing. I don't know if that's something we can do right off to the beginning, uh, but I have a very good relationship with Kevin, and at some point that could be a fun thing to do, and I'm sure he and I could you know, talk about that independently. I mean, we created Tomorrow Legion, but it's now part of the Rift setting, so mm-hmm. when he wants to incorporate that directly into Rift's books, uh, he will be open to do so, and uh, you know, that could be fun. That could be really, really cool. Okay. Next one I've got is how would you answer someone basically saying, I've got some interesting riffs ideas, but I don't know how to bring these ideas to life in the, in my game. Well, I'm actually writing a document specifically for that. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the exact title of it, but basically it's savaging your favorite riffs idea. Um, you know, and it's going to be a set of guidelines and, and uh, markers, if you will, some, some pointers on you know how to approach exactly that question. Um, understanding that people are going to have to learn the idea that you don't convert uh, from one system to savage worlds, you translate, you interpret. But uh, there's still some useful things that certainly guided me in, in the process that will also guide anybody else. I'm sorry about the barking. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, my, that's my puppy dog saying hello to people walking through the door. Um, but, uh, yeah, that is a specific document that a lot of the people following the Kickstarter are incredibly excited about. Uh, in fact, it was, uh, they were pushing really hard to make sure that got unlocked because just like the person who asked that question, there's a ton of people who are going to, you know, not necessarily want to wait for us to get around to writing the book that covers their favorite thing. It's uh, true. So we're going to empower them to go ahead and start playing with those ideas right off the bat. And, and that's that's good because also it makes people more comfortable to, you know, play with it, make it theirs and feel like they've got, you know, the ability to do so. Sure. I mean, we may never cover everything that's possible. I mean, there may just be that one thing that that one person really loves and we just don't get to it. Or there may be stuff that's in one of the dimension books, bearing in mind that uh, we're, there's some things that we're not going to be getting into because license doesn't cover those. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, or other palladium settings even. Right. And, uh, so they'll be it'll be up to the player to decide how they want to do that for for them and the, the gym to decide if that's going to work for the campaign. So yeah, we we understand that there's a lot of stuff to play with and, and Seven Worlds is extraordinarily adaptable to that idea. After all, it, it's taken you know Palladium 30 years now. I think they hit 30 years. Six. Well, if, if you count everything they published before then, maybe closer to 30. I mean, yeah. 90s when the original set, you know Rift book came out, but they had already published a number of things before that. So yeah. Yeah. So uh, here's a good one. What conventions or gaming events will Savage Risk be making it to this year and next? Ah, well, I leave tomorrow, as a matter of fact, uh, to get to Chupacabra Con in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm calling up my calendar as we speak, so it's more easy for me to answer this question for you. Because okay. my Google calendar is my life. Oh. Uh, so for Chupacabra Con, which is basically uh, Friday the 13th of May through the 15th. Uh, so you know, there's that one. Uh, as I scroll through, no conventions in June that I see. Um, now, unfortunately, I, I, I can't speak to Ross. Ross Watson may be going to some stuff as well, and he, he'll certainly be running Savage Rifts at the ones he goes to. And wherever Daryl Hayhurst goes at this point, I'm sure he'll be running stuff. I'm um, examining whether or not I'm going to try to make Crit Hit Con in Phoenix, Arizona. That's been something I was kind of wanting to go to, but haven't really been able to dis- discuss whether or not I'm going to be there. Um, that's in July. Uh, first part of August is Gen Con. I, I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> we're not, I, I hate to say this, but we're not coming to Gen Con. Um, we just are giving a pass this year. Uh, there's going to be a couple people. When I say we, I mean, Pinnacle's going to have, you know, J- uh, Jody and, and uh, Clint are going to be there. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure who else is going to be, but uh, I'm going to be deep in a lot of work at that point, and we just decided we're going to uh, focus on some other shows and some other things this year. Uh, Gen Con can be a real bear to plan around and try to make you know, happen just in terms of housing and everything else. It's it's tough, so we decided we're going to give it a pass this year. Um, right after that, here and locally in Denver, uh, in August uh, 12th through the 14th, uh, Myth and, Myths and Legends Con, I will be there. 
Uh, at this point, we plan to be at Tacticon in Colorado Springs, uh, first weekend of September. I am a guest of honor at Grand Con in uh, Michigan. Uh, that is the middle of September, the 16th through the 18th. Uh, actually, I think the 15th through the 18th. You have to check their site to be sure, but uh, they're, they're bringing me out to Michigan for that one. And then at the end of September, wow, my convention season kind of kicks in late, uh, RenCon uh, in Arizona, or is that, is that Tucson? That, that is here in Tucson, yeah. You you will be here, so I'll definitely be signing up for that game. Oh, yeah, so I'll be at uh, RenCon in Tucson. That's uh, That's been a plan. And let's see, then in November, back to Michigan for UConn. Uh, and uh, that's... Yeah, so that's uh, the uh, like the 11th through the 13th, I think, or something. So that's uh, 2016. I uh, do not have a clue at this point about 2017. There's a couple of conventions we've discussed, but yeah, I'm, I think that's enough for now. So. <laughs> I, I think that's a pretty full calendar just for the rest of the year. Oh, yeah. But, hey, I'm definitely looking forward to see you at RingCon then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to that one. I enjoyed myself last time. Yeah, it's it's, it's a great little convention in, in Tucson. Oh, now Ron Blessing's involved in that one. He's a, a good and dear friend. Blessed to get to hang out and see uh, all my friends down in Arizona. So, oh, yeah. Uh, Shane and uh, Open Daryl will make it. We'll definitely have to, you know, catch dinner or something together that you know that weekend too. Look forward to it. Cause hey, it's going to be at a new hotel this year. That's what I hear. Yeah, it's really you're going to enjoy it. It's a really nice one. Excellent. So, excellent. so the next question is, and this is a good one: What is the Rift's wild card symbol? Uh, yeah, you know we uh we we went round and round on that one. Believe it or not, that was one of the ones we actually wrangled for a while. It's essentially like a stylized uh death, you know, dead boy helmet head um and uh, you can actually see it if you go to the uh the rifts kickstarter on the uh, the, the wild dice yeah the, the you know the, the that symbol that's on the you know the wild die is also what we're going to be using for that Excellent. at least as far as i know now i can't 100 percent commit to that like you know i'm the ultimate authority uh but as, as i understand it that is the plan very nice because hey the color on the dice set was perfect you got this beautiful ley line blue with, with streaks going through it and then you got the metallic death head dice you know oh yeah so that's uh that is yeah that's exciting stuff i'm not sure if this is really pertinent with the new version but uh, i definitely get the person's uh, opinion on this question what is the best OCC and why is it crazies? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I think if they love crazies, they're going to be real happy with this book because uh, I definitely gave crazies some, some additional love. I was uh, particularly interested in making sure that they uh, stood strong and tall, uh, stacked up against juicers and everybody else. And it was kind of cool because we were able to take an established Savage Worlds mechanic and make that really work beautifully for a crazy. So we invented the idea of what's called losing it, which is essentially Berserk. They can go Berserk at will and get all the benefits of the Berserk Edge, which are pretty amazing. And being able to do it at will is extra powerful. Uh, and that means, you know, no, they're, they're, and, and there's additional things they're immune to fear and intimidation while they're under that. And then they're also... Um, they ignore wound penalties, plus two on all their, their melee attacks, plus two on all their damage, plus two on their strength rolls. Why should you parry, but at that point, they don't really care. Uh, and then there's really cool, crazy, iconic edges. Iconic, you know, iconic edges is a new kind of edge that we invented specifically for the iconic framework structure. Crazies can take specific ones that expand on that losing it power, which includes gun nut. It's one of my favorite ones, <laughs> which is you know, normally you can't fire ranged weapons when you're, when you're berserk, but gun nut crazies get bonus for, for attacks. Uh, for ranged weapons, you know, when they're losing it, uh, and then after they've you know lost it, they go through what's called a getting it together process, uh, which basically is where their psychoses and things like that kind of kick in. And they do end up, you know, just like crazy and the other thing. We we did come up with some tables for you know the kinds of hint, psychological and emotional hindrances that they they develop over time. And every new rank that they achieve under Savage Rules rules, they end up having to get uh, a new. Uh, psychosis or neurosis or some other kind of thing. It's a little, it's a little lighter. It's a, it's, it's a little uh, less. Oh my God! Involved as the, the insanity tables from riffs mm -hmm. uh, really gets the point across. Um, you know, so they've got that going on. But you know, again, they've got really great super soldier abilities, and they're also start out as, as minor psionics, and they can build up from that. So I mean, crazies are going to rock. Now that's I said all that. 
because of the way that question was worded, you know, <laughs> which is the best I OCC and why is it the crazy? And, uh, you know, I'm really glad to get a chance to talk about them because we've talked about the juicers so much. There is no best. I've been, I, I, I worked hard to make sure every single character choice was a good one. Um, now, this is a thing that really hardcore old school refs fans are like, well, but, you know, you're not supposed to have balance in refs. Uh, you're not supposed to. And I'm like, you know, that's all well and good. And again, it's nobody has fun the wrong way. If you're playing riffs and you like the fact that the Glitter Boy and the Vagabond, a.k.a. Hobo with a Shotgun, uh, are completely disparate characters, uh, you know, that's the game to play for you. And awesome, good, go for it. But for me, because the Savage Worlds experience is one that begets the idea of, of relative balance between characters, it was incredibly important to have that happen with this version of Rifts, the Savage Rifts version, that there would need to be more equitable uh, distribution of abilities. There needed to be, uh, every character needed to have good player agency, you know, good good agency to, to affect and have a, a, a good time in, in most or all the circumstances they might encounter. So whereas, yes, the Glitter Boy is awesome because <laughs> badass armor, badass gun, booyah. Um, you know, the, the, the Vagabond can be just as awesome because they're going to have more experience points. They're going to start out as a seasoned character with the Glitter Boys and Novice. They're going to start out with uh, all kinds of extra edges and some cool rolls on a special table that only certain types of, uh, of uh, you know, characters, the characters under what's called the Mars concept, Mercenaries, Adventures, Rogues, and Scholars, uh, they, aren't, they aren't the power characters that a, not of the raw, oh my God, front load power, but they get front loaded with, with other kinds of power and they can hit with vehicles, you know, in highly improved weapons and armor, a lot more edges, you know, other, other things that give them an, a level of agency that maybe the glitter boy doesn't have uh, because all he has is the big armor. He's pretty good at shooting and the really uh, big gun. Um, so I have had a chance to go through and mess with and tinker and I've had people play. I just recently ran a session where I uh, had a whole bunch more pre-gen characters and so they played the city rat. And the city rat had a cool hover cycle and was, you know, you know, flying the hover cycle around and doing two gun shooting. And the player absolutely adored playing that character and right alongside uh, a juicer and a burster and a mind melter and a glitter boy. Uh, and they were just having the blast and, and just as empowered and just as effective and having just as much fun. And the city rat had skills and abilities that the other guys didn't. The city rat was the one that was good for the stealth thing and the roguing that nobody else even could touch. So uh, they're all awesome, and and I'm really excited for people to, you know, see what happens when you mix and match all these ideas, and every one of them feels like uh, they're a fun character to play. Yeah, I mean, just from our experience, no one had a bad character. We all had a great time, and nobody was, I mean, hey, I was the Glitter Boy, but I was the big giant target purposely, and that's how I played the character, was like, hey, look at me, shoot at me, because your lasers yep. don't do jack. You know, and, and meanwhile, my combat cyborg, he was racking up the kills, you know. I'd take out walls, but he was racking up the precision kills, you know, shooting through doorways, hitting hitting skeletons on the fly, you know. Early he, on, I had the Wilderness Scout as one of the the, 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 the earliest core, core pregens, and typically when a player actually took the chance on the Wilderness Scout and then they saw what they could do, they were in the, you, you know, Number one, number two, or number three, the body count. And that's because they were letting the Glitter Boys and the Combat Cyborgs and the Leyland Walkers get all the attention while they were sneaking around, taking cover, you know, headshot here, drop a grenade and a bunch of dead boys there. You know, they were they were playing at ooh, ooh, uh, you know, Ranger City, and uh, and they were kicking ass, taking names. So, yeah, it's all there. Yeah, it's, it's you've, you've done a masterful job of bringing balance to where there was none. I mean, as, well, as, as a GM in the old system, it was I'd have to tell players either – we're going batshit crazy, or we're limiting it to just this. Right. I, I, I feel confident that if somebody wants to play a rogue scholar or a vagabond or, or any of those other types or just build something from scratch that they just want to try on their own, you know, using the system as it is, unless they intentionally hinder themselves, they're going to be fine. That's awesome. And, of course, you know, so much equipment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we, we had fun coming with ways for, you know, to be able to modify equipment and things like that. So, yeah, there's, there's stuff there. All right. So the last question I've got, which is going to be 
where can folks follow you and Savage Riffs online? Well, obviously, the Kickstarter is the primary place to follow what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, after the Kickstarter is over, of course, you know, the Pinnacle Entertainment forums, uh, which are some of the best forums in gaming communities ever, uh, that's going to be a great place to, to pose questions and, and interact with the Pinnacle staff overall and, and get things answered. Um, I'm one of the easiest persons ever to find online. I'm, I've got a very public persona uh, out there. So Sean Patrick Fannin, I'm, I'm incredibly easy to find on Facebook, also on uh, uh, G+, and I post there just as frequently. Uh, I have a site called seanspickoftheday.com, uh, which I do a lot of uh, stuff uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm showing off other people's cool games or their Kickstarters, or in some cases, the happiness, peace, and dreams thing where I'm trying to promote people's efforts to pr- pursue their dreams or get some help and things like that. So all that kind of stuff that I do as, a, as another thing. Um, but yeah, the, like I said, the Pinnacle site itself, G+, there's a Savage Worlds community. I post there a lot. There's a official Savage Worlds Facebook page, uh, or Facebook group. I post there a, a great deal. Um so yeah, I'm, and, I, and I put stuff across Twitter. I'm not really a Twitter head. I don't, you know, I use it very, very secondarily. I don't read it very frequently. So it's not a good place to get a hold of me. But yeah, you can find me on Facebook or on G Plus, and I'm incredibly easy to find there. All right, Sean, thank you very much for a great interview, man. I mean, it's tons of information. I mean, plus, you know, I want to, I want to go back and see what new stuff's popped up on the Kickstarter since just yesterday. Because oh yeah, well, as, as we're closing up, it is at three oh six four eighty nine. Is the is the current total, uh, and as I said, you know we've we've opened up that from three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand. We're going to be doing every ten thousand. We're going to be doing another you know, one sheet uh, adventure thing. Uh, so those are going to be pretty cool, and that's going to add to your adventure options on top of what we've already put in the GM's guide, and our, you know, otherwise you're publishing standalone. So definitely, and I'm going to work to get this put, uh, finished and edited tonight, so that way it can be out tomorrow with eight days left on the Kickstarter. Fantastic. Appreciate it, brother. All right. It's been great talking to you, man. Is there any, any shout-outs you'd like to give for anybody out there? Any podcasts? Any uh, groups that you'd like to, to say hi to while you're while you stay here? Well, you know what? I'm looking forward to seeing all my, my friends and, and fellow writers and designers at Chupacabacon in Austin, Texas, starting uh, tomorrow. We're, we're flying in tomorrow early, but we'll be there for the weekend. Uh, folks, who, if you can get to Austin, Texas, this is one of the most amazing, you know, if you will, cast lists you ever want to see. So the, it's it's like the, the big bar on TV. On to at Origins or, uh, you know, some of the, the, the early days of Gen Con. There's just so many amazing people are going to be at the show that uh, are great writers and, and designers and artists in gaming. Also, as we mentioned about RenCon, so your, your, your local folks there in, in Tucson, looking forward to seeing everybody and definitely be some Savage Rift games there. So uh, hopefully hopefully see a bunch of you guys uh, later this year at RenCon. But I really want to give a shout out to all of my, my, my fellow folks that I've been working with, uh, uh, in the Pinnacle team. Um, it has been an honor and a pleasure and just an amazing experience working with Shane Hensley, Clinton Jody Black, Aaron Acevedo, and Alita Saxon handling all the art stuff. Um, you know, Thomas Shook has been uh, helping, you know, with the just amazing layout and also editing and, and all this other stuff and just keeping us all straight and honest on how everything's going. The rest of uh, the, the, the Pinnacle family who's all been involved in looking at and watching and, and giving great suggestions. I want to repeat my shout out to Michael Kahn, John Wick, Jimmy Messias for the great uh, Shane's Garage sessions that uh, we had. Shout out to my, my, my locals here in Denver who all been helping run and play test and, and improve the game. And and uh, a special, very special shout out to Ross Watson, who's my partner at Evil Beagle. He's been helping me co-develop a lot of this stuff. He's been uh, absolutely invaluable in making this come together and work uh, in, in ways it wouldn't have without him. Kevin Simbita, thank you, brother. Man, this was a, a, the project of a lifetime, and it's it's because of you that I could do it. So get well soon. And he uh, unfortunately had a recent accident where he broke his arm, uh, but uh, hopefully he'll be, uh, you know, you know ride his reign here soon. And then, you know, finally, Corinne, my God, what you've put up with because of all this and your amazing support. Love you, honey. Aw. All right, and Sean, thank you for helping bringing all that and more together for, for Savage Riffs. Thank you, brother. All right, you have a safe trip getting to the convention, okay? You too. Uh, well, right. yeah, you have a safe trip wherever you're going next. Take uh, care. Next next trick will be to work tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Be careful going to work, then. All right. And, uh, hey, it's it's been a fun night making this happen, and I'll talk to you later. Take care, Jim. And like, like always, guys, thank you for listening.
Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the 5th Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening.